I'm going to talk a little bit about Thunder CTF, which is our security CTF that's built on Google Cloud. Um, and this is part of an NSF uh, project uh, that we have here at Portland State. Uh, most of the development was done by Nicholas Springer, who is a former student. Um, so uh, just to motivate why we're doing this, um, we've seen, I mean, we're all part of this cloud program. We've seen everybody shifting over to the cloud, more so now with COVID. Uh, people are trying to put all of their uh, resources on the cloud. Uh, this is uh, a figure from a couple years ago saying about 83% of the workloads are now going to have some part in the cloud. Um, when you do a survey for all the companies that are moving to the cloud, uh, in terms of what they're really concerned about when they move to the cloud, uh, you'll see some of the usual suspects, privacy, vendor lock-in, cost, uh, all of these different issues that make them not want to go to the cloud. But if you look at the top three, um, you see that security and the fact that people lack experience are like two of the top three. Um, and this is um, uh, leading, um, I mean, the reason why they believe this is if you look at what enterprise security currently is, so on-premise security and, and infrastructure, uh, it's an extremely complicated uh, problem to solve securing your own uh, assets. And so we have this problem in operating system security, firewall security, uh, updating all your machines, managing all of your employees and their accounts, uh, doing an inventory of all your assets, of all the data that you have uh, on premises, and then figuring out an access control policy uh, to manage all of that. And so with the cloud, you have all of that kind of stuff going on, but you also have an entirely new set of problems in the cloud. You have a completely different model of doing uh, access control. You have IAM access control policy management that's, that's different than what most enterprise security folks are used to. You have these things called access keys. Uh, you have to figure out how to manage and rotate those. That's a new problem. You have all of the different ways you can configure and we'll see misconfigure cloud platforms because they're all brand new. Uh, you have these things called federated identity providers, zero trust networks, authentication token management. You have to deal with API and application security. You have all of this on top of the problem that we were already having a hard time solving to begin with. And then you see some of the apprehension involved when, when companies are, are looking at the cloud to deploy some of their crown jewels. Um, and so uh, this, uh, this problem leads to uh, a lot of issues, and we've seen these show up uh, in the press. Uh, so misconfigured storage buckets is probably the number one thing that, that the press will report about. So two-thirds of American voter or two-thirds of the American population, the data was leaked online with an open bucket. Uh, you have uh, the military losing terabytes of information that they collected on social uh, media networks. We have misconfigured machine uh, snapshots. So like backups of your running instances left exposed for people to just like pull uh, from one cloud project to another. Uh, misconfigured databases. So I know this is AWS heavy, these, these negative headlines, but uh, you can misconfigure things very easily on Google Cloud. So there's a database. They didn't, exp they didn't say which backend was uh, exposed, uh, what the database backend was. Uh, but uh, the one here on the right, where all the uh, the mortgage and the loan uh, documents were leaked with an Elasticsearch uh, instance that was open. Uh, you have over-provisioned privileges. So this happened at Twitter, where um, because in the cloud, you want to very narrowly uh, define what people have access to. Uh, and this includes your employees, because uh, this was a case where a, a Twitter employee was turned by the Saudi government to get access to uh, uh, user data and exfiltrate that from the inside. Now, typically you would never want your engineer to have access to operational customer data or user data, but in this case, the privileges weren't set appropriately and then this uh, uh, it allowed this to happen. Uh, you have the same old problem of login credentials, usernames and passwords being used for uh, accessing cloud resources, so Uber, uh, their data breach was a result of having these credentials uh, exposed and then uh, having someone be able to get into that project and, and steal all the data. Um, you have this new problem of API keys, account keys, you have OAuth keys, you have SSH keys. And if you slip up and you emit one of these keys, well, uh, Starbucks, 
they, for example, they they leaked an API key in their GitHub uh, repo. Uh, Imperva, this is a security company, and the security company lost track of their AWS API key. And you know the problem's bad if a security company has a problem with their security. And this was done in the cloud. Um, and how bad can it get? Well, this is a paper from last year. How bad can it get? And what they did is like, so uh, Google and BigQuery's got the GitHub data set that's just pulling all the, the entries in. Well, you can just monitor that GitHub API and just search for keys being put into GitHub. And so on the right, you see part of the table from that, that paper of all the different search queries uh, that they're pulling to find out uh, who is pushing up their secrets into GitHub. And uh, they measured about 2,000 keys every day are being uh, pushed into GitHub. And it basically takes someone about 20 seconds of scanning this thing before they capture uh, the exposed key. So this is one of those things. If you expose a key, you just got to get rid of that key. Everyone's going to see that thing uh, go by. OK, uh, we have something that's really strange called exposed metadata. And that's something that enterprise security people are like, what the heck is that? Um, well, this is a service that manages all of this uh, authentication material and authorization material for any compute engine instance, for example, or, or virtual machine instance in the cloud. It's a standard way of doing it. So AWS has got this issue. Google, uh, Azure, they all have this problem of managing their metadata. Uh, and so uh, if this thing gets exposed, which it has been exposed, and this is what happened last summer in the Capital One hack, uh, if you are allowing access to that metadata service, uh, unbeknownst to you, they can get all of your uh, your authorization tokens and your account keys. Uh, and this was done via a security product. So they deployed this web application firewall, and you're like, ooh, web application firewall, that should really lock down my the security of my app. Well, it turns out it made the app less secure. And this is sort of a... Uh, I guess one of the things you have to be aware of in the cloud is that are, is that little security box actually giving you any security or is it opening you up to problems like this one? Okay, uh, and this is a really interesting teardown of the Instagram million dollar bug. This is from 2015. And I put this up there. If you wanna read about this, there's a link. All of these uh, headlines are linked if you click on them. Uh, so these slides are available from uh, a, a link that I'll show you as well. Um, this has got just about all of those things I talked about earlier, all in one. Uh, and so this is a really interesting uh, article. I'm not going to go through this, uh, but um, uh, it's, it suffers from all of these issues. Uh, and criminals are taking advantage of all of this, right? So whenever there's chaos, I think the criminals can come in there and leverage uh, the fact that there's a lot of confusion going on and then use it to their advantage, which, which they are. Um, and the question is, is that we got to defend against all of this stuff, and are we prepared? Uh, so there is this site called CyberSeek that looks at uh, uh, sort of the security workforce and whether or not we're well prepared as a society or not. And uh, I don't know about your state, but Oregon's numbers are uh, not so good. Uh, we have a lot of need uh, for security people, but we're not supplying very much in terms of uh, people who are able to work in this workforce. So uh, we have this class, uh, Web and Cloud Security, uh, that is trying to address this thing. So uh, the class, uh, we have Code Lab. So we uh, use the Google Code Lab stuff. Uh, I think uh, there's going to be a talk this Friday about setting up Code Labs in the regular Google Cloud faculty hours. So we've done custom Code Labs for all of their, our security courses. Uh, you can see them here. There's a link uh, to uh, all of these uh, Code Labs that we do. Uh, we start out with web application security, all of the different ways you can program vulnerabilities into your into your uh, server and your client uh, software, and then we move to the cloud and we talk about different ways you can you can lose all of your stuff from the cloud. Uh, and so all of our courses, uh, well, we have we're, we're working on a, a set of uh, code labs for each one of our courses, uh, and those are available here. Uh, uh, from from this codelabs.csfpdx.edu. So so that is our um, uh, that is uh, sort of the code labs. And so within this, we saw that we did some web application stuff, and we want to do some cloud security uh, exercises. But if you look and you look around to see what kind of cloud security exercises there are, well, there's PureSec got this OWASP serverless goat uh, uh, exercise, and this is done on AWS. 
Uh, you have Rhino uh, Security Labs. They have Cloud Goat, which we use. That's also AWS. Uh, you have Flaws and Flaws 2 from Summit Route, and that's also AWS. And so we're like, well, you know, we're doing a lot of our teaching on Google. We do a little on AWS, but like, what is there for Google Cloud? Uh, and so we looked around a, uh, a couple of years ago, there was pretty much nothing on Google Cloud. And so that's what uh, we decided to do is we tr decided to build a CTF, uh, a security, a set of security exercises to teach students how to navigate security in the cloud. Uh, and that's what I'm gonna uh, talk about now. Um, so uh, we have played a lot of CTFs here at Portland State. That's one of like, it's like our hobby. It's like making learning a game. So we like doing that here. All of our courses have CTFs sort of like woven into them. Uh, so we have particular favorite ones. And from a design perspective, we know CTFs that we love and we're like, let's copy that. And so uh, Thunder CTF is no different. We have looked at some of the best design CTFs and we're like, okay, let's, do, let's use that technique. And so in its design, um, there are four sort of broad areas that we're shooting for in the design of the CTF. Uh, the first is that it, wa it uh, we want it to be scenario-based. We want students to role play what it means to be an attacker to try and go through the cloud trying to compromise a project. So putting yourself in the shoes of the adversary is a really important thing for security practitioners to do. Um, and they're going to role play with actual exploits. We want to actually follow like the Instagram compromise. We want them to actually follow those steps to see what it means to have a full life cycle from initial access all the way to the to the uh, uh, data exfiltration or whatever the, the goal uh, is. Uh, we want the CTF to be scaffolded uh, in order to support what we what is known as differentiated instruction. We want the CTF to be useful to the, the novice as well as to the expert. And this can be very difficult, right? Because you're typically trying to target one or the other, and it's hard to get a, mod, a learning uh, exercise that can work for both ends of it. Um, and it, it needs to be extensible. So one of the things with security is that it's always changing. <laughs> And so we have to enable developers to add, remove, and customize all of the different levels that we deploy based on the current vectors of exploitation. Um, so that's the third uh, goal. And then finally, we want this thing to be easy to use. We want the setup to be frictionless. We want the thing to run at low cost. So it should not take a $50 coupon to run this thing. Uh, we want it to be polymorphic because we use this in classrooms and we don't want students to just, you know, copy someone else's work and say they've done the uh, exercise. So the levels are polymorphic. The flags that you capture are, are polymorphic so that each student uh, uh, has to show a different flag. Um, so those are our design principles. I'm going to briefly run through uh, how we support each one of these uh, design principles. Uh, the first is scenario based. So in security, there's this thing called the MITRE attack framework. And it's basically a comprehensive industry standard enumeration of all the uh, techniques that hackers attackers have used on them. Uh, so this is driven by the threat intelligence and incident response communities in security. And so they just enumerate everything that they've seen someone do. They're like, OK, let's put it into this framework and like enumerate all of them. Uh, and so all of the APTs, these are advanced persistent threat crews. Uh, they've got these things called tactics, techniques, and procedures in the MITRE attack framework. And it's basically uh, just a one-stop one shop for all of the things that you need to watch out for as a, as a security person. So here's a picture of the MITRE attack framework for the enterprise. Uh, and if you look across the top are the 12 major tactics. These are classes of tactics that an adversary will use to try and compromise a project. So the initial access, the execution of, of any code, persistence into the into the enterprise. All of these general tactics are across the top. The techniques in each one of these tactic categories follows below in the column. And this thing runs all the way down through the bottom of this screen. I'm only showing you a, a subset. Like uh, on defensive evasion, there's like 70 techniques. So it goes all the way down. Uh, and then what's interesting are the procedures that, that uh, an attacker will use. So a different APT crew will, for example, have different green circles. And this is their playbook for uh, compromising a platform or a project. So these are the tools that they have at their disposal. This is their expertise that, that they use to basically go from initial access all the way to 
things like data exfiltration? What is their goal? And so uh, that's basically uh, what we want to show students uh, when we teach this. And we want to be able to teach them how to go through that full cycle so that they can get into the shoes of the adversary. So there is a MITRE attack framework version for a Google Cloud that's very specific to Google Cloud. Uh, and you can see it's not as comprehensive right now because there's not, in fact, this was only released like a year ago. So they're still fleshing this thing out based on ways they've seen projects uh, be compromised. Uh, and so the scenarios that we want to build into our CTF are scenarios that can map onto this framework. And so these are the at the bottom are a list of sort of the techniques that we cover in our CTF. You see the things in light red. These are things that show up in our CTF that we're trying to show students uh, these particular techniques as they apply to the cloud. And because the framework is extensible, if we really feel like some of these other ones would be nice to have covered. We would have people uh, try and develop uh, different uh, different uh, CTF levels to cover those. OK, so here's an example scenario. And this is modeled directly after the Capital One breach. The last three steps, in fact, are the Capital One breach. Uh, but we like sort of longer levels. Uh, so uh, the scenario here is that you obtain some account key. So you exploit an application. And typically, when you exploit an application, you get some presence with some credentials on the cloud platform. And so you, you, uh, you, you take that uh, compromised account key, and then you do things like list the project's virtual machine instances. And then if you can do that, you can see some of the metadata that's attached to that virtual machine. And so maybe you can see that there's a container image that that virtual machine is, is using to run. And then if that image is, is open, you can pull the image. And then you can examine the code inside the container image. And then maybe that container image has a proxy that gets implemented. And then with the proxy, you can do a what's called a server-side request forgery attack to access the metadata instance uh, running on that virtual machine. And then you get the credentials. And then you basically use the credentials to access a storage bucket. And then you pull all the data. And so this is a, a, a picture of what a, a, a student uh, interaction with our CTF would be like. So uh, this is mostly the, the last three steps where you're taking a look at the container image. You're seeing the different layers that implement it. Uh, you get into the container and you see, oh, what is this thing uh, implementing? And you see there, the, there's this proxy. Maybe it's in a hidden URL. And then uh, if you uh, have this proxy, and this proxy is meant to say, give me google.com, and it'll proxy that google.com request to pull the site google.com. But if you send it to the metadata instance, then it'll proxy access to the authorization credentials running on the metadata server. And then you can see, because it's allowing that, you can actually get the access token for that virtual machine instance. And then you basically use the access token. This is uh, just straight from OAuth. And you, you, you use it to hit a uh, Google Storage API. And then this allows you to pull secret.txt from that API using the compromised token that you got from, an, from uh, the metadata service. So this last step is, these last three steps are, are effectively what the Capital One breach, uh, 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 the, 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 the hacker in the Capital One breach did. OK, uh, the next thing is that it's scaffolded. These CTFs are, so CTFs in general, in, uh, so the ones that we had played initially that were really, um, that really turns a lot of beginners off, they're typically designed to be evaluative. They're, they're basically based on competitions where you're trying to pick a winner. And so in these CTFs, they're designed to be really hard uh, in order to separate the participants. Well, when we deploy this into the classroom, that doesn't work. We want CTFs to be uh, a learning vehicle. And you have to redesign the CTF format to support learning rather than competition. Um, and so uh, in order to do this, we have taken a differentiated instruction approach to the CTF. Uh, and so first of all, we have scenarios with gently increasing difficulties uh, when we do our design. Uh, but we also have this hint system. And the hint system is critical because if you want, if you have a novice and they need their hands to be held all along the way, then you can use the hint system basically like a code lab. And then you just strip through the interactions. But you know, for the advanced practitioners, you, the, they would want to ignore the hints. Don't tell me the answers. I want to see if I can get it myself. 
And so that's what the hint system allows you to do is like, if you really want to challenge yourself, uh, you can, but if you're getting frustrated and you want to get unblocked, you have the hint system there uh, able to get you unblocked without having an interaction with the instructor or the TA or, or, or whatnot. Um, and so the, what we're striving for is to balance challenge and struggle. And so this sort of tension is what will lead you to this state called flow, which is a psychological state where you're really into it. And uh, that's what we're looking for to give to get students at that point where they're uh, where they're feeling a little challenged. There's a little bit of struggle, but then there's also support there to, to, to keep them going. OK, so here's an uh, a picture of the hint system. So there's different hints all throughout. So this is from the uh, level that I just showed uh, earlier, the container level. Uh, and so we can we can point people to the direction where, uh, oh, take a look at the, you know, for example, the manifest of the virtual machine, and you can see that it's running this image. Uh, and then later on, if they don't know anything about the metadata service, if we haven't given them the lecture, uh, they can find that uh, uh, through through a hint. Okay, uh, the next thing is that the thing has to be extensible. Uh, so the shifting, if you're in security at all, you'll realize that there's the, the threat model changes all the time. Uh, there's a threat and then, then someone pu puts out a countermeasure that gets rid of that thing. And if, if it is the case, for example, this metadata service SSRF, that's becoming a dead bug class now. Um, Google has some protections in there. AWS was forced to put some protections in there after the Capital One breach. Uh, this requires, on our end, a continuous change in the content, right? As soon as Google shuts down one avenue of compromise in the cloud, that ruins our level. <laughs> and we have to be able to change the level in order to address that. And so we have this pretty extensible framework. Uh, it not only allows people to add new levels, uh, but it also allows them to add completely new CTF sequences. Uh, and we do this through namespaces. And this will be uh, explicit when, if I have a time to do a demo. I, I can show you how the namespace works. Uh, we, we currently are working on a, a separate CTF sequence based on more application security. So the, what we have now is focused mostly on cloud. And then we have a sequence uh, focused mostly on web uh, that we're working on. Um, and so this is a picture of the UI. So for Thunder CTF, the namespace for the cloud one is Thunder slash, and there's, there's six different levels. Uh, and so we'll have a WebSec one uh, uh, eventually. Well, I don't know when, but uh, we're, we're, we're toying with, with a different one. Uh, and to support this, we have, um, if you want to create and contribute a new level, um, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, you have levels, which are on the left, that are specified with uh, three things. Uh, the top two things, uh, the way the framework works is it relies on uh, Google's Cloud Deployment Manager. And it, and it uses the Cloud Deployment Manager API to be able to automatically deploy the infrastructure uh, for the level. And so as part of that, we have a Python script that uses the Cloud Deployment uh, packages to deploy infrastructure. And then uh, to deploy, the way you specify the infrastructure that you're going to deploy are through YAML files. And so for you, you have to figure out the kind of uh, uh, resources that you want deployed. And then you, you have a Python script to, to actually do the deployment. And I can go through a code walkthrough of this if there's time. Of And it's really simple. If, if you look, it's not. It's like maybe a couple hundred lines of code, a pretty straightforward Python code. Um, and then the last thing is the, uh, the actual hints. And the hints are a simple HTML file where it is just a sequence of all the hints that you want to give to the to the player or or, or the student. And then from this, uh, this uh, this Python script uh, relies on the, some of the framework code. So this is the CTF framework code that we have built. Um, and then these things will either deploy the infrastructure or generate the actual hint page uh, on the side. So those are the those are the main pieces of this framework. Um, we have documented both the level module development guide. Uh, if you go to the wiki from the from the GitHub, you'll see uh, the, the development guide here. And then the actual CTF framework that the script, the Python script uh, leverages is over here in, in, in this on this link. And these are the helpers that we uh, have because actually when you program directly into the cloud development uh, cloud deployment manager, it's kind of a low level. Thing. And so we have built some helper functions to, to, to make it easier for us to do the deployment without doing all the low-level uh, cloud deployment stuff. Okay, 
Uh, and with uh, the last thing is that this thing is deployable. So it only requires a Google Cloud account to, uh, to play. Uh, it consumes a minimal amount of resources. So we have gone as much as we can to serverless things. And if we do have to instantiate a virtual machine, we instantiate it on the free tier, <laughs> if at all possible, because we're cheap. Um, and so you can play all of these levels uh, under a dime, uh, pretty much. So then the, then the students are like, oh, OK, I got my $50, and I can actually still spend $49 of it. So that, that, that helps. Um, the code is freely available. Uh, this is the link to the GitHub. And then the, the, the actual interface to launching levels is really simple. Uh, you just uh, call the script with create, and then the level you want to deploy. And then when you're done with that level, you just destroy it. And, and we only allow one level at a time to be deployed. Uh, so that's the, that's the interface. Uh, and then the last thing I mentioned this earlier is polymorphic uh, flags to, to support courses and certifications. OK, so we've run this two times. Uh, we ran it uh, last quarter in our web and cloud security class. We also ran it in our internet web and cloud systems class. Uh, we actually did a survey uh, in the fall class. Uh, and the CTF rating, one was very unhelpful to five very helpful. And we had 36 students respond. And uh, the first question is, uh, does it help you understand uh, security issues in the cloud? And that got almost a four out of five. Uh, developing skills and navigating the cloud. That also got about around a four and a out of five. And then the hint system is what really students enjoyed. Like to be able to rely on the hints uh, to make progress through the CTF, that, that got a, a really good rating. And so with that, I would like to do a demo. Uh, do I have time? Can I, can I use the rest of the 15 minutes or I'll try and do um, it. Yeah, if we can maybe do it just eight minutes on the demo and then you, All right. you you must do the demo and then I think time for Q&A. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so actually, since I won't, probably won't be able to get back to these slides, uh, I'll probably have to end midway through the demo. Um, I'm going to take you through the A2 finance uh, level uh, where you exploit the thing to get to dump credit cards. Um, and if you look at this, what we're going to do is we're going to access some initial permissions. We're going to figure out what what the project is running. Uh, we're going to access a bucket. We're going to do an exfiltration of a Git repository. We're going to find an SSH key exposed in the repo history. Uh, we're going to figure out that there's a compute engine uh, instance that's running that actually has a public key associated with it, an SSH key associated with it. We're going to use this exposed SSH key to get onto this virtual machine. Um, this virtual machine has access to the logging infrastructure, the stack driver logging. And then from there, we're going to be able to access unsanitized error logs. Uh, so this is a web app. So this follows the web application uh, modules that we do. And one of the no-nos is to not sanitize your error logs. And so the unsanitized error log is then exfiltrated. And then you can find the person's credit card number, which is the flag uh, that we want people to, to see. Um, and so with that, I'm not going to be able to do the code walkthrough. I'll barely have time to actually do the walkthrough, which is what I'm going to do now. Um, and so, uh, uh, one of the, so this is the, this is the, uh, the page, uh, Thunder CTF page. Uh, you can get all access to all of the resources. The slides are linked here, the PDF of a paper, uh, where it's described at. Um, this is the initial setup of the CTF. You have to activate your project. So if you're not doing this in Cloud Shell, Cloud Shell will automatically set your project. Uh, but like if you're running G Cloud locally on a VM or on, on your like home machine or something like that, you just have to point it to the right project to do the deployment on. Uh, and then you create a Python environment uh, for our CTF. Uh, you install the requirements. And then you activate the project. So what you need to do is enable all the APIs on the project that we're going to deploy the CTF infrastructure into. So that's what this thing does, is it goes and it, and it enables like, I don't know, like cloud functions and all of the services that, that, uh, that are, we rely upon for our levels. And then the levels are here, uh, A1 open bucket, A2 finance. So if we'll, we're, going to, we're going to do the finance one. Um, and I will, I'll just go through here. So here is a, uh, an environment. Uh, that has the Thunder CTF on it. Hey, um, quickly, yeah. take a breath. 
we're going to keep recording as long as you keep talking. Um, we don't need time for questions and answers. We can do that in, via email. Uh, okay. If anybody has to drop off, we understand. We will share the recording as soon as we get it. Oh, this okay. is way too cool to make you run through. <laughs> okay, I'll slow down talking because you know I, I usually talk fast, but I was trying to talk a little bit faster. Okay, so here you are. Uh, this is after you've done the setup on the on the Google Cloud project, and so I've I've created the environment, I pip installed uh, all of my things, and so now I'm I'm here. And uh, typically, what I would do here is I would do a Python create thunder slash A2 finance and let it run. Uh, but I've already done that because the deployment takes like two minutes. So I knew I, I didn't want to spend time uh, with those two minutes. So I've already deployed uh, this particular thing. Um, and you, you'll get, when you do the deployment, uh, you'll get something that looks like this. So uh, when the students deploy the level, it says initializes and then it's in progress and then it'll get uh, every level starts with the student activating a service account. Uh, so typically uh, the beginning of the class, you're exploiting an application. As soon as you have ex exploited an application, you will have access to the service account being used to run your application. And so for that, each one of our levels first starts with a service account and a service account key in a JSON file that you will take on the role of. And the idea is to start from this role and then elevate your privileges to, to reach your goal. Uh, and so the first thing that uh, we have, uh, so if you look at the goal of this uh, level, uh, we wanna get Jimmy Pierce's credit card number out of this project. So that's the, uh, that's the goal. Um, and so the first thing that you would do is a G Cloud off and then this is actually given in the walkthrough. You want to activate that service account. So the flag for that is uh, key file is equal to, and then everything is in the start directory. They tell you the, the, the credentials are in start slash a2 access.json. So we've activated the service account. Uh, and then from here, the first thing that you would want to do is you have a service account. You want to figure out what this service account has access to. And so you could just brute force all 1,800 permissions uh, that the Google Cloud Platform exports. And in fact, we have a listing of all the different uh, uh, permissions in script slash testable permissions. And you can see this is a list of all the different permissions that you could be given in a Google Cloud ser uh, service account. And so we have allowed, uh, so we have this really this utility script called test permissions. And then what we do is that you point us to some uh, key, account key, and some a service account, and we'll show you exactly what it has access to. And this is the Python script. And so in this case, and I'm sorry about the highlighting, this thing uh, says this is the service account key file I want you to use, which is in start slash a2 access this.json, and I want you to be able to figure out what credentials this thing has access to. Uh, and so this is the first step of every single level. It's like, okay, uh, you've given me a service account. Uh, what is, uh, so Python scripts, test permissions. What does that service account have access to? So this is, uh, this is the initial credential. And if you look, this thing has got, let me see if this is, uh, this thing has, uh, you can get compute instances, you can list them, you can figure out their zones, uh, and it's you can list storage buckets uh, with this service account. And so, oh, I can list storage buckets, so maybe I'll just list uh, list what storage buckets this thing has access to. And you see there, there's a storage bucket right there, gs colon slash slash a2 bucket, so maybe uh, I'll just uh, list that storage bucket. And then you can see this storage bucket has a dot git directory and some function. So maybe, uh, let's see what that git directory has. So I'll, I'll make a directory. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll do a gsutil uh, cp-r gs colon slash slash. I want to type, 
And so I'll take that storage bucket and then I'll copy it into foo, which is the directory. And then it'll go and copy everything over. And so uh, now I'm in this foo directory. Uh, this is the bucket I just downloaded. Uh, there's a function in here. The function doesn't, <laughs> there's, there's nothing in this function. It's got zero bytes. Uh, but we're interested in, hey, look, there's a Git repo. And all the good stuff is in a Git repo. So uh, I'll go in here, and then I'll say, uh, well, git status, maybe. Uh, it's on master. Uh, maybe I'll do a git log. And if you look, this is the git log. And you say, hey, um, I added initial files as the first commit. And then the second commit is like, oh, deleted the accidental key upload. And so hopefully that key doesn't get you anywhere, because that key in the initial commit is still in the repo. And so this is what we want students to know is that you can delete it off a of master, but it's still in the history. Uh, so we'll do a git checkout of the uh, 9CD CEE. And uh, now we're basically on that, uh, that commit. And if you do an ls in that directory, you see the thing called SSH key there. So you're like, sweet, I have an SSH key now. Um, and so if you want to use this SSH key, if you look at the permissions on that, it's got group and other readable. SSH doesn't like that. So we're going to just change mod that to uh, 400. Uh, but we don't know what this SSH key is good for, right? Uh, we know, uh, hopefully it's not good for anything, but you know, this is a CTF level. So maybe we will, we already know we have compute engine list. So usually SSH keys are used to SSH into virtual machines. So now let's see if we can find a virtual machine that we can have access to. So I'll do, do G Cloud uh, Compute uh, Instances uh, List. Uh, and let's see uh, what uh, instances there are out there. So there's a logging instance. So there's only one. So uh, maybe I, I want to look at, and see what this logging instance has on it. And so I'll do a G Cloud Compute. Oops, Compute Instances uh, Describe. Oops, have completion going. Oh, actually, I do want that. And so if you look, this, uh, this instance is in US uh, West 1B. Uh, the name is A2 logging instance. So, yeah. Uh, so this is the command to basically describe what that instance is running. So I'll hit that. Uh, and uh, if you look at this, you can look at, at this is the metadata uh, that's part of this instance, or part of the metadata. Um, and you can see all of the different parameters that this thing is running. So this is part, part of service discovery in the cloud that the adversary would want to figure all this stuff out. And lo and behold, in the metadata, uh, you can see there is an SSH key that's stored here. Uh, the name is cloud user, and it's got that fingerprint. So maybe the SSH key in the Git repository that I just got is the one that gets me in here, and the username is cloud user. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I have an SSH key, so I'll do an SSH-I of the SSH key. And then it'll be cloud user uh, at, and then I need the I need the IP address here. So this is the IP address. When you do the describe list, that's the IP address. Uh, so I'll do that. And so then I'll SSH in there and says can't be. Oh, uh, say yes. Now here I am as the cloud user and on the logging instance. So I've been able to elevate my privileges to get a shell on this virtual machine running in this uh, cloud project. And there doesn't look like there's anything here. Um, one of the things you can do is as soon as you have a shell, you can do really interesting things. Like you can do G Cloud off. Where's my? Uh, uh, you can print the identity token of this virtual machine. This authenticates the machine to uh, the Google Cloud APIs. And this is a very useful token to have. The other useful token to have is the G Cloud Auth uh, print access token. These are the tokens that this machine is going to use to access the Google Cloud APIs. So uh, you, you saw uh, 
in the previous example, the A6 container one, I was using an access token there uh, to get at the storage bucket to pull the secret down. So all of the so the service account that's running this virtual machine has access to a bunch of APIs based on whatever the roles were that were attached to the instance. So now I can actually use that token to get at all the different APIs on the Google Cloud backend that this particular VM has access to. Um, and so we will see that this access token, when, when we do the uh, Capital One level, um, that's the access token that you can actually get using, and let me, um, I have this URL uh, in my cloud project directory. I'm gonna do a wget on this. Uh, this is the magical URL that will print your access token. And so if you allow someone uh, to do a proxy on that thing, you can just do a wget of, of that. And this is the same token. You, if you look at this token, uh, oh, it's gone. Oh, this token, YA29, uh, all the way to KQ, this is what gets passed back if you hit the metadata service uh, with that same thing. So this is just something, this is a preview. It's not germane to this particular level, but these are the issues that we're trying to teach students, uh, basically how to navigate around the cloud to get credentials that you probably shouldn't uh, have access to. Um, so uh, the goal, we have this logging instance, the goal is to dump a credit card number. Uh, and so uh, one of the things, it, it's got the name logging instance. Well, it, it probably has access to the logs. So what we'll do is we'll use the uh, G Cloud logging uh, uh, subcommands and we'll say, well, what logs uh, does this thing have uh, access to? And you're like, oh, look at all these logs, uh, all the activity logs, data access. Hopefully none of those have important things uh, in them. Uh, but then we're like, hey, look at this. Uh, projects, TCTF01 logs transactions. We're like, hey, I bet you there are credit card transactions in that log. So maybe I'll do a G Cloud uh, logging read projects, TCTF01 logs transactions. And then uh, this will go back to Stack Driver. This goes to the centralized st Stack Driver. And then you can see, look at all these people with all of these uh, uh, things that look like credit card numbers. In fact, it says credit card number. I bet you that is a credit card number. Uh, so uh, we were looking for, um, what is his name, Jimmy? So one of the things with this level, everyone is looking for someone else, right? So uh, uh, because we, we poly polymorphically generate the person to look for and the numbers, uh, so we were looking for someone named Jimmy. Um, um, I'll grep. I'll just put it into less. And then I'll look for someone called Jimmy. Was it Jimmy Pierce? I don't Yeah. So if this was Jimmy Pierce, then you would have his credit card number uh, right there. And that's what we would, we don't have a checking infrastructure, uh, but like this is what we have students take a screenshot of and say, okay, you finished the level. You got the guy's uh, credit card uh, number. Um, so with that, that is the full walkthrough. Uh, yeah, um, I can do a code walkthrough or we could just wrap up there if, uh, if you'd like. I'm having a bit of an existential crisis now. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, is, are people able to stay on or do you want to do a quick Q and A? Feel free to speak into the mic. <laughs> Doesn't sound like there's any questions right now. OK. Um, maybe a couple minutes of walking through the code, and then I'll just, I'll just wrap up. Sure. Um, we, we, uh, I wanted to show you how, I mean, it's, it's not the simplest of things to do. You definitely want a mature sort of a, a, an experienced student to do this. But I just wanted to show you the innards of the framework in case you're interested in developing levels uh, of your own. 
Um, so this is a part of the, within the, the Thunder CTF framework, this is an example of the A2 finance level that we just talked about. And I'm, uh, I'm gonna first start with the YAML files that specify all of the assets that are deployed when you create the level. So all of the stuff you just saw was dynamically created when we launched the level through Cloud Deployment Manager. And if you look at that, there was a bucket that had the Git repo. Uh, there was a service account that we are using to initially give the students uh, a credential. Uh, there's also a service account with the logging infrastructure. So there's two service accounts there with different permissions. Uh, there's a virtual machine that runs the logging instance. Uh, and then there's a policy that we describe that uh, tells people which permissions that they have, which service accounts. Uh, and so this is what the YAML file, and these are the deployment manager is gonna use this YAML file to deploy all the infrastructure. And so you can see here's reader access uh, to the buckets. Uh, this is the VM, the logging instance VM with the username and public key, and that gets generated on deployment. Uh, this is the IAM policy. So the initial IAM, uh, those are the permissions that we want the initial credential to have or the, the service account to have, and that's it. Th those are the things that we, um, uh, that we use to deploy. Uh, this is a Python script that's using, um, this is sort of, this is our own internal framework. Uh, and then we're using some of the Google Cloud uh, APIs. Um, and so this is uh, creating the thing, the creating the level, we create the SSH keys and the usernames, uh, and then we construct the Git repo that we want the people to exfiltrate. Uh, and then we insert this deployment into, so this is the initialization, this is the data we wanna instantiate. Uh, and then we uh, deploy this thing. Uh, and then we, um, uh, after we deploy this thing, we actually have to upload the assets into the bucket. Uh, we have to upload the log files into the credit card backend. Uh, and so this is the style of level design that uh, you would have to do if you wanted to deploy your own level. Um, one of the things that's here, uh, we have this randomization here. This is where we do the polymorphism. Um, so uh, one of the things with buckets, actually, if you deploy buckets, they have to be globally unique. So this is part of this randomization is to make sure the thing is globally unique when you deploy it. And then the other part is to generate the polymorphic flags. Uh, so that's there as well. Um, and then this is the hint, uh, the hint file. And you can see every hint is separated with these three dashes. And then you just specify the HTML uh, in each hint that you want to specify. And then the framework will index that so that it's a progression that students can follow. Um, so that's basically a brief rundown of some of the code and how you would express a level uh, using the Google Cloud uh, APIs. And so with that, I think that's all I want to cover because that's that's probably a I think a reasonable amount to digest. <laughs> so are there any any questions or? Sure, I have a question. Hmm. So how did you come up with the scenario? You know, did you already have something that existed and then kind of work backwards and write it out into chunks or did you go step by step? So we have seen a lot of scenarios. Some of these are from, um, if you've played some of the AWS Cloud Goat uh, scenarios, uh, some of them are inspired by that. We had an initial version of this uh, that we uh, adapted to this framework. So we've been working on just ideas for levels for a while. And typically with levels, you're trying to figure out how to pivot from one resource to the next. And so trying to show all of the different Google Cloud services was another one of our goals. Um, because there are so many, by doing this, you can sort of understand what the service is offering you. Uh, when, um, because for, for example, like the container registry or, you know, a cloud function or a data store, uh, what are those things offering you? So when we have those in the, so I mentioned if this was run in the internet and cloud systems class first, we have all of these services that we're trying to teach people. And then the cloud security thing is trying to reinforce that where they're gonna see how some of those services that they were learning, how those could be configured to, to expose uh, uh, sensitive information. 
Um, in terms of uh, the, the, there is lecture content. So we just don't, we, uh, we don't send people straight into the CTF. We actually do have to teach them about service accounts and roles. Uh, and that lecture material is actually um, part of the, um, so the course that's associated with this, uh, a second here. Uh, we do have slides here. Uh, these are so we do teach them a lot of the basics uh in these slides uh, and these are the things that they would have to know to navigate um you would want to go through this curriculum first before you sent them onto this exercise yeah well, thank you i really enjoyed it it was really cool i, re I really like this and um, that's really inspiring Okay, some quick questions. Uh, is this a graduate level course? And uh, how many hours uh, would this, uh, or maybe it's a two semester long course or one semester long course? Two um, questions. This, this particular course is a 10 week sprint. Uh, okay. Yeah, this is the, uh, this is so <laughs> poor cloud security only gets like three, three weeks, but. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, this is effectively uh, three weeks, uh, a three week exercise um, in, in our course. Yeah. It's for graduate students or? Um, it's an elective in our undergraduate program. And then mm -hmm. um, it's cross listed uh, undergrad grad. Um, mm -hmm. And this is where the design for novices is really essential because if you have someone coming in uh, that's a little greener, you need them to be able to solve the levels. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's where the hint system is really helpful. Like um, they can actually just use it as a code lab. And if they don't understand the commands, if they're just parroting the commands, that's at least a start. Uh, and so eventually if they revisit the CTF, uh, they'll be able to get a little bit more out of it the next time that they play. And we've actually had students play this multiple times because some of my students from the first offering in the internet web and cloud systems course took the web security course and then uh, they they went through it a second time and then the second time they were trying to do it without the hints or with less mm -hmm. hints um, yeah so do, do you have a, a follow-up course that just since in this course you teach people how to exploit the vulnerabilities on the cloud do you have a course that teaches how to counter the such counteract such <laughs> yeah so Actually, this so this is a grad only course that I teach. Mm -hmm. um, so the MITRE attack framework is really useful when you're talking about defense, because the defender is deploying controls, and the controls have to line up with the procedures that an APT crew is going to use against them. And so we have in the MITRE attack framework, we have enumerated. For example, I go through this this sequence where election security. Well, we know APT28 and AP29, uh, they're coming after us for this election. And so we understand the tooling that each one of these APT crews has. And so we can go through the MITRE attack framework and we can see where their tooling has been. And then we can deploy controls that attempt to eliminate that technique from, for example, your cloud pl platform deployment. So one of the, for example, the APT28 and APT29, one of the key things that both of them did was spear phishing uh, mm -hmm. to get the initial account credentials. And so uh, because of that, this is why Google has their advanced protection program. Uh, uh, you basically deploy a, a Titan key or a, a Yubi key, and then you completely eliminate that that particular part of the matrix. And that will, so, so this is where the defender can use what the attacker behavior is to put the controls into the matrix and to be able to line up their controls with the APT crew techniques that are coming after them and say, this is what I need to work on. Um, and that's what this, uh, this computer security research seminar is doing. It's trying to get students to figure out what all the different techniques are. And then the, the, we talk about uh, controls that would prevent the different uh, different ones of these. And this is the one, This is, I'm running this right now, actually we're in week four, um, but that's what we have as a follow-up. 
Wow, great. This is, this is truly amazing. Thank you for the great work. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you for uh, attending. I will hand it back, I guess, if there's... Awesome. No... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Great presentation. Um, I kind of want to take this class. Can you just come back and teach it <laughs> in the next <laughs> couple of office hours? Just kidding. Um, okay, great. I know we're over. So um, I think if you have any further questions um, for Wu Chang, feel free to drop them in the email thread. Um, and with that, I think we'll just wrap up and, and let everyone get on with the rest of their day. Thank you. All right, thanks. That was wonderful.